Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Richard. <laughs> How are things? Everything going in Chicago. Every, everything's great. It's a beautiful sunny day today, which is you know kind of new. <laughs> well, that's the time, but it, I'll it, take it. At least, yeah, at least it helps certainly during the pandemic to have some sun in your life. That's awesome. Yeah. How are things in Michigan? Uh, Great, great, sunny, beautiful day today too, so no complaints. Uh, today, we are supposed to interview each other and find out exactly what makes us tick. I know, and I'm so <laughs> excited to do this with you. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start because I just, I'm the old guy here, so I get to start, that's the way it works. All right, <laughs> sounds All right. good, fire away. So let's start with some simple things like, where were you born and how did you get into saxophone playing in that early part of your life? Oh, sure. Um, so I was born and raised in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, you might know it as like the where uh, Space Camp is, the, and there's a lot of NASA stuff that happens there. So there's a lot of education, uh, a lot of really educated people there, which is great. Um, and it's kind of interesting too, because they have like this Saturn V rocket there, which is kind of our cool. coup de gras. Yeah, it's great. It. And like, it's, it's even cooler because when you see it, it's like right across the street from like a field of cotton. So it's just like this <laughs> it's, really cool. It's, it's the new Alabama and the old Alabama. Right? Exactly. Exactly. I love um, it. I love yeah, it. that's right. Yeah. yeah. So um, I actually got into music because my sister really was um, excited about, she really uh, started to sing in a, like a church choir or something. And I wanted to be exactly like her. So I joined um, the church choir and then we started taking voice lessons and then I wanted to take piano lessons. So I started taking lots of music lessons at a young age. And then uh, when around middle school, there was a really good band program in uh, a public middle school. And so I went to that school and they told me I could pick out whatever instrument I liked. So I picked up the saxophone and I mean, I just fell in love with it. And ever since, you know, I haven't put it down. <laughs> you know, it just has such a really cool, unique voice to it that I just I've never stopped loving so um That's cool what yeah. about you what about well, you know your roots to the saxophone? my roots my roots to the saxophone start uh, actually back in my hometown uh, I was born and raised the first 20 years of my life in Lansing Lansing Michigan which is uh the capital city and during the 50s and 60s when you know I was growing up that was a huge bustling incredible manufacturing town uh, five or six uh, auto industry plants, uh, high level of employment. Uh, and the, be the best part of uh, growing up in Lansing was I lived right next door to East Lansing, Michigan, which is the home of Michigan State University, with a oh, tremendous yeah. with a tremendous music uh, existence, if you will. This whole ecosystem between Michigan State and Michigan was just just remarkable. We had Larry Falcone at uh, Michigan State, Bill Moffat, who was the marching guy and doing Bill Moffat Sound Power Series, a famous series of marching pieces and, and method books. And then just down the road, uh, we had uh, Ravelli and that entire staff. And uh, that was an amazing uh, situation. That's the first time I met Donald Senta was at a, at a Bandorama event in, in Ann Arbor. And uh, Mr. Sint and I had a kind of off and on really interesting relationship. That's a long story that I won't go in here, but he's, he's, a father, he's, a father, he's a father figure to everybody he meets. And it's the same with me. But, uh, yeah, my brother was a jazz piano player and really hit me up to, to great, great music. I mean, my first birthday present from him at 12 or 13 years old was Miles Davis, uh, Live at Carnegie Hall, my funny Valentine album. So that was my first experience with listening to jazz. It was pretty amazing to me, and it was it kind of changed my life from that point on. Uh, and yeah, and I went. Uh, I had a really bad middle school and high school, well, junior high school and high school music department. Terrible, terrible, terrible. But Lansing Conservatory was a great place to go. I was able to, you know, use a little bit of that and do some all state present uh, performances, which is when I played with the Ravelli and the all state group, which was, uh, you know, my life changing as well. Changing yeah. one year with Falcone and the all state group and all that stuff happened. And just, that was kind of, we, we just, that's what we did. It's, it's just, it was there. It was all there. It's a pretty remarkable time. That's a super, oh, what a great place to grow up as a young musician. Yeah. Yeah. It, 
it was kind of an assumption too, you know what I mean? I mean, I, the, the, we only had a 60 piece high school band, not a big band. This is the school of uh, 2,800 people. I had a 520 person graduating class, inner city school, 60 piece band. There's something wrong with that picture, but the group of musicians in that um, band were so interesting. I had a timpani player who happened to be a brilliant piano player, jazz player. I heard him playing in a band room one day, just playing some tunes. And I went, man, we get, we put together a little saxophone, a little uh, jazz quartet. Uh, we, <laughs> and we actually wrote, there was a, there's a play called Thurber Carnival. Uh, most high schools will perform that. There's music with it, but the music, we didn't have a pit orchestra to do the music. So Robert Watson and, and me got together and wrote the tunes. It's, it's, it's passing music. It's incidental music between the scenes. We wrote all the music and played all the music. And that, so in high school, everybody looked at me as, oh, well, he's the musician. He's the player. He's the, you know, because it was just easy to do. There wasn't a lot of competition. I was the only guy, <laughs> the only saxophone player who was interested in that. But it turned out to be a really, really cool experience. And yeah, we, we found a, a bass player from a cross town rival. Sexton High School was across town. We, we, we got a bass player from there. I taught a, a, Randy, our drummer, had never played jazz before. And I taught him based on listening to Miles. And this is how you should sound. This is what it should be like. This is what you do. Okay. And, you know, he kind of picked it up. And that's how we put this band together at this, you know, 15, 16, 17 age group. It's just crazy. So yeah, I had a jazz quartet when I was 15 years old. 16 that's years old. great i mean it only takes one person to get to get that bug though you know yeah if you one know, person that, has it you can spread it fast it, it is it's something and robert watson this piano player robert was such a interesting and unique player this was all again by ear he didn't have any piano training per se but he, he heard everything and he played it so this whole thing was a rote you know kind of an oral experience for us we all learned this stuff by hearing it and playing it we didn't read anything that's and that's amazing. And, and I think going forward in, in my career, that whole oral training really, really helped me as I got more into the studies of that. So yeah. it's just it's just one of those strange little slices of of an experience that just kind of pushes you a direction that just you know becomes inevitable at that point. Yeah, I remember. Um, I my best friend growing up was the my middle school band director's son. And he would just show me so many different uh, jazz records. And then we would just listen to the same record over and over and over again to make sure. Um, and we wouldn't stop until both of us could just sing each solo. <laughs> just not even play it, but just sing it. And I just remember Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, they're uh, nice. moaning. Oh, man. I can oh. I can do the trumpet solo, I can do the saxophone solo, I can do the piano. Well, I can't sing the whole piano solo. The range is too high, but I can try. <laughs> but I can well, just... That's you know, you, you actually, that experience, that experience of singing, and I, I, you caught my attention when you said you started, with, you know, kind of in the choral aspect before you took, took saxophone. You know, that's the thing about saxophone. It's such a personal instrument, right? That you end up singing. It's a singing instrument. It really is. And it, it, it really it does, is. Yeah. It does kind of project your own voice and your own sense of voice. Uh, which is why it's why it's so unique. I mean, there are thousands of saxophone players, and we all have our own tone center because it is our voice, and that 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 is incredible. There's a story about that. When I was at Berkeley, uh, my private lesson teacher that at Berkeley was um, uh, Andy McGee, and Andy would tell me stories about seeing coming meeting friends to walk to school, and they would say, "Hey, man, did you?" Had, did you hear that Art Blakey album, man, with moaning on it or whatever it might be? <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Check it out. Check it out. This is the tenor player does this. They would scat sing to each other what they heard on the record. Really? And I said to myself when during that lesson, I said, man, I mean, I had, I, had, I had music in my life. I didn't have that music in my life. That's amazing. And, you know, but it's a, it's a generational shift. So what you were doing, man, it's very old school and very cool. <laughs> I feel really lucky to have, yeah, he was a very great influence on my life as just, you know, and he, he did a lot of the stuff that I did too. I mean, he did jazz. He also like played in the wind ensemble. I mean, so he and I were just, you know, connected at the hip growing up, but um, I think he went on to be a a great music educator in Alabama. He did his music ed there. And so, and then I, as you know, went to Chicago 
And so tell me, tell me, you went to you went to Chicago. Not, you did your undergrad and your grad work at DePaul University. Yes, which is a, right down the street from the studio. Really, you can almost throw a stone and hit it from our studio. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so tell me about that experience and how you got there. How I mean, what was your decision to get there, and and what what was it like when you were there? Yeah, so I decided I really wanted to move to a city, um, and LA and New York seemed both a little too big and a little too far away for me, just you know, for commuting purposes back home. So I decided to go um, to Chicago, and DePaul just was the right place for me. You know, I connected really well with the teacher at the time. Uh, her name was Susan Cook, and then for the first year, and then after that, it was uh, Jeremy Ruthrell. I mean, they were definitely the most pivotal people of my life to just kind of direct me to to kind of what my perception of the music industry was, what the what a career in saxophone performance is going to be like. They really just shaped my my mindset. Um, and so I, you know, I owe them so much, but doing my undergrad was, you know, in a, in a city in a kind of conservatory like school was being surrounded by like-minded individuals who just really, you know, put the work in was just such a, such an important experience for me. And then of course, I mean, probably the most useful, uh, summer was when I went to Brevard in 2016 I studied with Joe Luloff. That was just that just not only not only had I just opened my mind to you know the saxophone studio at DePaul, but now it was just like the whole world of saxophone just opened up to me, and you know I, I got to see Tamer Sullivan, I got to see um, Jeff Leffert, and then you know the other people were who I was studying beside um, were just all great people from studying with great saxophonists, and so not only did I get to you know appropriately nerd out as much as possible <laughs> but I also got to but I also got to you know study with some of the greats and so it was just yeah. a great a remarkable experience and that's yeah, I, I, you know, never... I was just gonna say Luloff is uh he's uh he's such a great teacher and and you know if I there are two soprano saxophone sounds in this world that I would love to cherish to own one of which is Joe Luloff and the other is Bramford Marcellus those guys the tone quality on both of those guys is just extraordinary, and it's Butter. you know he's he's lyrical and he's he, uh, he's a wonderful. That's a great teacher to have behind you. And uh, so, it, uh, what else besides the people that you met at Brevard? What did you find and kind of being able to nerd out, if you will? <laughs> what else about the Bernard, Brevard experience? Which you know it's a really now it's a renowned, famous place to go for this. What else? Yeah. Uh, what else did you get from that? Well. I mean, I think the very first thing that I learned was how reeds acclimate or don't acclimate from Chicago to a place that is a rainforest. Yeah, um, I definitely, yeah, that was a, a hard, a hard lesson to learn. And so I had to, you know, revamp what I was, uh, the reeds that I had brought and I had to break into new ones and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was a pretty tough lesson to learn. And then beyond that, it was just, you know, playing with so many great players and musicians. I remember um, I got to play we were doing a night at the movies concert and I got to play this like extended solo from uh, sunset Boulevard. And yeah, it was just cool. It was just, you know, an incredible experience. I had never, I mean, me being only 25, I had never seen the movie at that time. And I, mm. um, and so it was just like, wow, I need to watch this movie it has music like this. I mean, I've heard great things anyways. So d things like that, it was just, and then just everyone that I met there was just such a lovable, likable person and so inspired and ambitious that it just really like struck a chord in me. And yeah. that was, you know, right before I started um, my master's and I just started to work at Danzer, which I really pieced together because they were both, I, I, they both really converged into like opening me up into like the, the real world, if you will, of yeah, uh, sure. instrumental music playing. Cause you know, be, being a grad student, you start to kind of, instead of looking inwards into your community, you start to kind of reach more outwards. And mm -hmm. then Danzer was just the same and Van Dorn was just the same. You know, I just started to meet all of these saxophonists and all these great clarinet players that are just, I mean, <laughs> remarkable people. I mean, some of them are my icons and it's just, they stroll into the studio and they start talking to you. And I'm like covering my starstruck eyes, trying to <laughs> not, <laughs> not make a fool out of myself. Yet you end up helping them <laughs> yeah. when they come in. You are, you know, that's that's the give and take of that. And the best part of uh, the music community for me is this this um, 
the interpersonal relationship that people can learn from. You can learn from anybody and you can yeah. pick up ideas and concepts and product discussions and, and gear setups from anybody. And so, you know, yeah. it, it's a community where there, I, you know, there are some, but there, for the most part, I find people who come, they're always looking for, Hey, you know, what's working for you. Uh, my great, my greatest example is that I mean, you, we'll come back to this a little later, but, um, my greatest example of that was when I, I first met Claude DeLong when he just got appointed to the Paris Conservatory. And he had eight days that he wanted to do a U.S. tour. And he wanted to say, you know, so and I was a young Van Doren guy at the time working for Van Doren. And he said, just pick me eight places and let's go see what they do. And I said, well, I can do that. So I took him to Indiana, University of Indiana, University of Michigan. Michigan State, Indiana State, which had Harry Gee at the time, and uh, Northwestern. And Northwestern at the time was Fred Hemke. So in a very short period of time, he saw what was the absolute gold standard for uh, classical saxophone in the United States. But the interesting thing about Claude, who was just now the Parish Conservatory professor, and it was his program, whenever he met somebody, the first thing he said is, what new music are you playing? What do you have that I can learn from? What music can I get? I, can I can take back to my students. Every single stop. I was so amazed at his humility, but also his desire to learn and to completely continue to grow. Even at this prestigious position, he wanted to be someplace else. He wanted to be bigger. He wanted to be better. He wanted to make his kids better. I thought that was extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's great. And the best part about it is just, you know, Claude... I mean, he kind of trademarked something that's amazing about music, which is that like everyone really does have something to offer. Like everyone you can learn from and then everyone has a unique voice and, you know. And then, I mean, going back to the studio and kind of what I learned from that, it's true. Everyone wants, everyone wants to sound different. Even if you want to sound like someone, you're, you know, you, you have your own personality that really impacts the way that you perceive sound and the way that, you know, just your own physical nature in which you sound different. So it just really creates everyone differently and that's such a beautiful thing and then you know being able to help channel that to help people is just one of the most remarkable things about being in the studio and it's just you find yourself just being i i mean it makes me feel so valuable <laughs> well i mean it, it it is a it's a great feeling and it's always special i think that's one of the things that we have in terms of our philosophy is that you know we're not i, I always say that if the first word out of your mouth is i you're not a great artist relations person. Because the first word out of your mouth should be you. What, what are you up to? What are you doing? How can I help you? What do you need? Because that's kind of who we are. We're, we're the people who have, you know, we've been trained, we've learned a lot, we've had experience with the Van Dorn family. We, we have all this inside information, this good, strong information that helps to make good decisions. And we're just there to, you know, pass that on. That's, that's the whole deal. It's not a, not about us being better or worse than anybody. It's just us being helpful to some people so they actually can find their voice and really go out and speak what they want to say. Yeah. I mean, and also, you know, it just helps me too to hear what everyone has to say. Cause and, you know, every time it's like learning a slightly new perspective on, you know, just playing the saxophone or playing the clarinet. So it's just such a really interesting uh, ex it, and just valuable information for me too. Yeah, that's that's and, pretty cool. Right. And then right when I was starting my master's too, uh, going back to the question that you asked. Um, but, you know, and so that, I think that really helped me. And of course, like my, um, in the back of my head, I always wanted to just continue teaching. So I, um, I was kind of getting, wanted a higher education so that I could, you know, teach at a, at a, a university or college or something like that. Um, but I, my master's was also a really special time for me because I, I won the wind symphony concerto competition. And then I also won the symphony orchestra concerto competition. And so like both of those experiences of playing with my peers, they were nerve wracking, but it was, I mean, <laughs> I mean, talk about, you know, magical, you know, I, yeah. I really, I, I, those those are both very special performances to me. And so uh, enough about me. What about you? How did you, um, you know, undergrad, graduate, or I understand you kind of took a um, a slightly different route, right? Yeah, I did. I, you know, I, I, I uh, graduated from high school. I wasn't sure if I really, you know, you get to those moments, you're like, do I really have what it takes to be a professional musician? Can I be a professional? And what exactly is that? 
<laughs> and how does that exactly look? You know, at 19, uh, 18, 19 years, I was, I was really struggling. And uh, I was in a little group playing around Lansing. We were a little quartet. Had a steady gig at the uh, Holiday Inn Lounge. We were fancy and hot and playing. But we were playing tunes. We weren't doing anything, you know, no rock. We were just playing some jazz tunes and stuff. It was fun. And uh, I had, so I was going to the community college in town thinking, you know, just kind of trying to sort out what I wanted to do. How, if I was going to play, what was I going to go to New York? Was I going to, was I going to go to school for it? I, you know, I didn't really know. Uh, so I had, I had, I had a class uh, this last quarter of the year. I had a, a eight o'clock class that I could never make because I had a gig the night before that we did. I didn't get home until <laughs> like two or three. And, you know, the gig was at eight o'clock, and, and I never made. I made it. You know, like a week, I never got it there on time. And so I said, told myself, self, you're going to lose money. You're going to fail this class if you don't drop it now. So I dropped the class. Now, back then, I, I'm old enough to where I had a student deferment from the Vietnam conflict. I was 2S. That's before the lottery system. There were a draft, there's a draft system. And I was exempt from military service because I was in school, but you had to keep a certain amount of credits, which I failed to realize until I got the notice that since you dropped the class, you're under the limit, therefore you're draftable. Oh no. I had, a, that, I had a heart attack from that. That was like crazy. So I had, all right, how do I, how do I get out of going and carrying a gun and sh killing people I don't care to kill, don't even know, in the rice paddies of, of, of South Vietnam? Um, but not be illegal. So, you know, uh, I looked at different military service opportunities and I ultimately picked, picked the Air Force. Uh, and I was actually in a, a career field that allowed me to learn, I mean, a ton of stuff. I was learning electronics, mechanics, hydraulics. Uh, and when I was stationed at my permanent base, I stumbled into a, interesting enough, I stumbled into a band um, that played all over uh, central uh, the panhandle of florida where there are tons of military bases so we played everything from the navarine club which is a naval air base in pensacola all the way to tendal air force base in panama city and everything wow. in between there must have been 15 or 18 bases we'd play every weekend and it was a it was a nine-piece soul band and this is a reference you'll have to look up but we were called the spidels and the twist of flex band spidels <laughs> used to be a watch band <laughs> Way back when you could buy watch bands, and it was a twist of flex. That's, that was their commercial. So look that up on a uh, go. You, just due to Spidel twist of flex, you'll see. But it was a it was okay, really okay. a fun. It's a really fun group. We played some crazy places. We had a great time, uh, and I and I met. I got in because I met a guy who's walking through the Airmen's Club carrying a, a trumpet case, and it had a Michigan State University decal on it. And I stopped him. I said, "Hey, did you, did you play at Michigan State? Because I, you know, I did a few camps there and stuff." He goes, "No, actually, I, I, I went to Michigan, but I did a summer camp at Michigan State." And I said, "Really?" So I, we got to talking. Yeah, well, I'm a saxophone player. I said, "I'm in a band, and our saxophone player is getting out of the military. He's getting out. He's short. They call it short at that. He's short. <laughs> we need a saxophone player." I said, "Not uh, here." So, so I show up, I play in the band, I played the band for the entire time I was in the military because I worked a grave shift position, positioning equipment for uh, flight testing and stuff so that I only worked from basically midnight to five or six in the morning. So I went to school at Okaloosa Walton Junior College and I studied with a guy named Al Nudo, who was an alpha player, who was definitely a jazz head from, from Buffalo. He gave me a World Ledger piano to take home. Wow. Uh, for me, he says, take it home. And here's your first theory lesson. Here's your second theory lesson. Here's how I'm going to teach you some two, five, one changes. I'm going to show you how to play those. So basically he taught me jazz piano through a book and through him showing me when I went and see him. And I played this big band and it was just, it was way too much fun. And by the way, all adjunct, I didn't attend. I didn't pay for any of this. I just went, showed up and said, hey, I'm looking to play. And he said, oh, come on and play a little bit. And that's how we did it. So wow, that's amazing. My first, my first recording experience was in, in, in there. There was a great uh, little recording studio. Finley Duncan ran that studio, and Finley was a uh, the guy that owned all the slot, uh, all the pinball machines in the entire military bases. So he had tons of money. So I had recording studio, crazy stuff. So I so when I when I get close to the end of that time period, 
I realized, yeah, this, I definitely want to do this. Where should I go? And certainly Berkeley came up to be a big deal. Uh, but the best part is I could go to Berkeley on a GI Bill because four years of military qualified me <laughs> to have a GI Bill and I paid for that. Uncle Sam. GI Bill. So it, that was a great experience. And the best part of Berkeley at that time is that they were pretty much, if you, if you could hold a horn and play a scale and breathe, they'd accept you. And because it was a smaller, it, you know, you have to remember this is 73. So it was a much smaller school. Right. Um, they were only in two buildings. And at that time, the uh, uh, best part was I, I, when I auditioned, he had these season stuff. Could I mean, to my career, like from what I heard, I mean, I could read, but I didn't read well. And I didn't even read quickly, nor did I read, did I sight read. So he puts this music in front of me and I read through it and I completely demolished that. Then he said, well, let's, let, let's play a couple tunes. And so he says, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just, I'll just start playing blues. He didn't tell me the key. And I just started soloing with him. He, goes, he stopped and said, where'd you learn to do that? I said, well, you know, from the time I, from the time I played, this is what I did. I would listen to the music. I just, you know, we just played. That's all we did. He said, man, that's great. Keep, keep going. So we played two or three choruses. So the, the long and short of that is that they put me in these remedial classes. They accepted me and put me in remedial classes for sight reading and, and, and some basic theory stuff. And in, in a matter of uh, a semester or two semesters, uh, I was at or above where everybody should have been because I was voracious. I was just eating and drinking it like, you know, like crazy. Right. And to this day, I don't think I would have been accepted in any other music school in the country. You think? Because I had, I, I had those kinds of deficiencies. I truly believe that what Berkeley did for me, of saying, we understand you have huge deficiencies, but we see something in you we like, so we're gonna accept you, and we're gonna teach you the stuff that you don't know, and let you hold on to the stuff you do know. Yeah. To, be, to me, mind boggling, just earth shattering to me, because, it, it was somebody saying, we believe in you, and now it's up to you. And uh, I said, that's all I need. It's just If it's up to me, I'll, I'll take care of that. So You just needed the stamp of approval. Yeah. And so, you know, the, thing, the other part was that's really tricky is I have a music ed degree from Berkeley because that's the only degree they had at the time. They all, everything else was a certificate program, and the GI Bill would not pay for a certificate program. No. Only a degree. So I went to music ed because I had to have a degree. I played in a ton of ensembles. I, you know, I took line writing class with, with uh, you know, with Herb Pomeroy and did all that stuff in the summers. I took summer classes all the way through and got all my jazz and comp stuff at the same time and fell in love with teaching, by the way, because there was something else in me instructional that kept, kept coming out. And I think a lot of it has to do with me really kind of respecting the approach that Berkeley took. This is a non-traditional learner, me who has learned a lot and we gave him an opportunity because he's a non-traditional we saw the opportunity to actually make him into more of a traditional type learner and to me that was so inspiring as how to teach that you should accept anybody from where they are with their potential and say you're here now but you can be here as mike phillips says all this the distance, distance between this and this is just a lot of work go do it and yeah that's kind of, that's, to me, I'll, I'll forever be thankful for my Berkeley experience. It was a really, really great four years. And I actually graduated. <laughs> <laughs> I did not leave early. I actually graduated because I, because again, I had to have a degree if I was going to get teach. Right. Yeah. So that led me, led me to the teaching career. I taught for a while. And the reason I left teaching was I kept getting, I was teaching in Detroit uh, in an inner city school. Um, designing my own programs for middle school music and doing everything, all of this and having a great time. And they kept, they kept pink slipping me because they kept running out of money. Oh no. And every time they pink slipped me, they would try to put me back into a different, different region. So that means all the work I'd done in region seven would not apply to region six. I had to start over again. So I said, enough's enough. I'm going to see if I can really do this thing in New York. I'm just, so I went to Miami to do my, my you know, my master's in comp composition and moved to New York and the rest as they say is <laughs> cra a crazy history and then your life changed when you met me no, no I'm just kidding exactly <laughs> did. no question I, from day one I knew that there was a big change coming 
<laughs> no, 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 um, no. But something I that, that I just find your um, your track and music, your career in music, is just so interesting because it you really do cover so much ground in so many different fields of music, and I and I love how that kind of just really does get incorporated into dancer and how we you know how we treat music educators and music performers and administrators. I mean, I feel like it it really gives a unique insight to each of them and how they all work together to create the entire industry. And I, yeah, I, know, I, I think that's incredible. To me, yeah, to me, that's, you know, the, uh, the, of course, there's a famous book, right? It Takes a Village. It was the book that was either vilified or loved, depending on where you're from. But the whole concept of, of music uh, and, and education, performance, composition, uh, it's all part of a community. And that ecosystem works to serve each other, right? I mean, it works to serve each other and ultimately the art that's produced serves everybody. So if you can't look at all of these aspects as integral and equal parts, it, 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 you never get to the art that everybody loves and wants to hear, wants, wants to experience uh, at the end of that tunnel. So right. it, for us, it, it behooves us to make sure that the youngest kid is inspired because the youngest kid could turn out to be the next Branford Marcellus, the next Joe jo Lula. So for us, the benefit is to be able to encourage, and go back to my Berkeley days, let's find, your, let's find your deficiencies and let's find your strengths and let's just tell you there's a little bit of work between the two and you can be there and you've got what, that's, that's our job. That's what, if we want to keep music and the art form growing and moving and expanding and and doing what we know, which we have seen so much of during this pandemic, right? We've seen so much music uh, that because that's suddenly everybody's turning to this, turning to music as as an outlet online right. because th it's the only thing that allows them to feel something. And that's not totally true. There's a lot of other visual art and stuff. I'm, I mean, I'm, if you've not seen out some of the art exhibits that are online now, that's stunning stuff. But people want to hear. They want to hear it and be able to relate to that. So that's all our job. It's all kind of connected for that to happen. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. No, it really is. It really is. I feel so lucky to be a part of it. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, you're a part of you're a part of Chicago. So not only did you go to school, you live in Chicago. What parts of Chicago do you like the most? What's really got your attention in Chicago since you moved? That's a, that is a difficult question because there's so <laughs> many good things. I mean, the city's so great, man. I mean. Um, let's see. I mean, first and foremost, I guess the people here are just so nice. I mean, Southern hospitality and Midwestern, like friend friendliness, they kind of go hand in hand in a way. And so I, I really felt at home here from the get go. Um, I mean, the people are so great. The music scene is just incredible. You know, I can't, there's so many jazz clubs, blues clubs, and then also just the class one musicians here are just incredible. The food is incredible. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 yeah. I don't even know if I have to continue, but I mean, the food is incredible. Then the art, I mean, the Art Institute in itself is just, I mean, you can spend weeks there and still not see everything. It, I don't know. I just, every time I think, I, sometimes I'll like, you know, go home to visit my family or I'll visit a, another family member in another city and then I'll come back and it always feels like I missed Chicago, you know? Mm. Like the second I see it, I'm like, oh, I missed this. This is, yeah. this is, this is what I like. This is what I like to do. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, I will, I will, I will say that there's one thing that I really don't like, and that's the winter time. Well, <laughs> spoken well from some other in Alabama, of course. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, it's below too long. Zero? What's that? Yeah. What's that about? Yeah. I know. And it's also really too long. If, if, I think a lot of us would feel more inclined to be there in the winter, which, you know, I'm not. <laughs> uh, if if um, if it was if it just a, if it didn't start to like uh, late November and it finished the first of March, okay. If that was the winter, we could all be happy with that. But the fact that it drags on sometimes up to the first of May is enough to make you want to kill yourself. It's just yeah, yikes. You forget about winter part two and winter the third act and <laughs> that's right. That's right. There's you know, a I'll... recapitulation, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you always get the, like like a like a snow in like late April, and you're like, why? Yeah. Well, I, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Um, the, 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 the things I like about Chicago, 
I have, I've kind of touted this unknown fact for years that uh, the city of Chicago has more outside art than any other city in the world, including Paris. Wow. wow. Yeah, and it's and if I'm correct, I think uh, uh, I was as I was reading through the Crane's business uh, that this part of the uh, when you actually file for a new building in in the little bird downtown, um, there's a percentage you have to tack on or a kind of a tax that you pay that's directly devoted to outside art. Really? So, you know, that's why this town has a Picasso in Thompson Square, right? The, the, the city building, the city, city hall building, whatever that is, uh, there's a Picasso standing out right in front of that, which is ridiculous. It's amazing to think about that. And the, you know, and the, and Cloudgate, this is an extraordinarily beautiful thing in Midland Park. And everywhere you go, you know, you'll start noticing now, as I said this, you'll see how much art you see in neighborhoods and, and the like. So that's one thing I love about it. The other part I love about it is that on a normal, in a normal year, when there's no pandemic here, uh, from Memorial Day to Labor Day, there's a music festival every weekend in Grant Park, downtown, every weekend. There's a Celtic festival, there's a bluegrass festival, there's a jazz festival. Uh, they just go on and on and on. There's a Ukraine music festival. It's just one after another. Wow. Oh and, my God. You know, so that goes on. And then if you don't, anybody who's not, who sees this, who's not from Chicago, when you come, there's one thing you do, take the, come in the summer and take the architecture tour down the Chicago River. Yes. Yes. That's yes, amazing yes. stuff. That's yes. amazing stuff. It's, <laughs> it's it. It'll change your perspective on what Chicago is. If you thought Chicago was this little second city podunk kind of town, you'll change your mind when you do that tour. And that's, that's really what I love about the city is it's kind of a off the radar city if you know what i mean i mean a lot of people oh you're from chicago oh, that's nice oh that's great but that's about where they think if they don't if they've never been here once they're here they go oh yeah i get it i know why you're there every time i have a family member visit it's the exact same story it's always just like wow i never yeah, knew it, chicago was this cool and i was like yeah. i had i yeah i had no idea that's the word that comes out i you're absolutely right yeah I had yeah no idea that's crazy so, so uh in terms of people who you love to listen to, what's your favorite, who are your sax saxophone players you love to listen to the most? Oh, that's a hard question. I, I know. I pick, <laughs> that's a hard, that's a hard pick, question. Pick, pick two, <laughs> pick two or three. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, I mean, I, so, since we've talked about him, both um, Joe Luloff, of course, I mean, he is, he's just so emotive. His sound is so beautiful, but, He's such a passionate, passionate player. Um, he really, and he just understands how to captivate an audience in a really cool way. And then I guess, you know, the other person I, I can't, I can't not say his name is Claude DeLong. I mean, right. no one can do Claude like Claude. And I mean, he just, I mean, if you, if you, if anyone who's watching, if you haven't listened to him play before, just listen to him play. I think you'll understand it's, it's captivating. It's, it's intriguing, it's beautiful, but I mean, he's also just such a master of the instrument. It's just, it's incredible. Yeah. I mean, and I think when you, when you told that story about, you know, kind of his curiosity, you can really tell that in his sound. I mean, he's always yeah. looking for something and it's, it's so captivating. It's just, every time I hear him, it's, it's captivating. So yeah, I think those would have to be my, probably my most two listened to saxophonists. Um, it can't, in the can't go wrong, can't go wrong. <laughs> what about you? Who are your two favorites? Well, I, you know, I started and, and still, I kind of consider myself a tenor player, even though the most majority of my work in New York was on alto, which is kind of <laughs> unusual, but it was the, it was the instrument of choice in the seventies, thanks to Mr. Sanborn. So everybody <laughs> asking for alto, alto players, but um, yeah, I, I, I've always been moved by uh, Cannibal Adderley, because Cannibal is, again, a lot like Joe Luloff in that he's incredibly expressive. I mean, he is, there, it, there is this cerebral intellect that Cannibal is as a person. And, um, and he, play, he plays like that. There's this intellect and this, and this harmony and, and, and melody and his son, man, it's just, it's so him. It's so, it, it's just, yeah, I can listen to him all day long. And the other, 
uh, I, I would say, you know, I do love uh, train quite a bit, but, uh, Taco Train, but I, I think I'd have to lean on Dexter Gordon as another guy who is his own man, who speaks his own way, who, who you know when, you, when he says that, but you're hearing it from him. It's his heart. Yeah. And that's yeah. the stuff I really like. That's the stuff I really, really like. So. That's, yeah, I mean, as a classical player, I guess there are slightly fewer people that I can choose from, but as a jazz musician, I just like, you just go through each decade and you can find at least three saxophones. Who are that, well, that, that's the truth. And, you know, and, and it is, it's interesting that that's the, it's been, you know, the jazz side of the saxophone has, uh, it's, first of all, well, I, I should say that, but it, it's just, there are so many more of those guys and it's been around, you know, because of its nature as a dance opportunity in the very early time, you know, 20s and 30s and 40s, uh, it's progressed through this, but man, the history of that is 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 remarkable to watch, as it is on the classical side from you know from you on on forward. But yeah, I mean, it's changed so drastically, yeah. and yeah. also yeah. like you know this. I think the fact that we didn't have the confines that a lot of other instruments had kind of really greatly benefited from that because people could really we didn't have to stick to tradition in the way that a lot of other instrumentalists had to and especially with jazz i mean every they were always looking for the next best thing and right. you know everyone was looking for their own voice and to value that really is what creates this kind of stimulus of creativity right. it's, it's adventurous that's what it is it's just <laughs> adventurous it's just, and it's so exciting yeah. to see what comes next you know you never like yeah. when someone else comes you're like what how did you come up with that yeah yeah <laughs> that's true okay so now since you're a chicago guy uh, yes. Ketchup or mustard on your hot dog? Oh. <laughs> Come <laughs> mustard. on. Mustard. You gotta mustard. have it. But yeah. That's, that's, no. that's mandatory. The city of Chicago. <laughs> yeah, There's absolutely. No ketchup available. Absolutely not. I will, I, will take ketchup, I will take ketchup on fries, but I will not. Does not touch ketchup the hot on fries. Dog. That's legal, but you, you cannot touch <laughs> a hot dog. You cannot even suggest it to the hot dog. I love yeah. that part. Well, so. As, <laughs> Hop deep dish or, or New York style flat? You know, me personally, I I like my pizza to be as big as possible because I want as much pizza as possible. So I gotta I gotta, I gotta go deep dish. Yeah. But as someone as someone who's from New York who has lived in New York and Chicago, I, I would what's your style? I'm an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> I, I love them both for their own reasons, you know. There's something yeah. special about a New York pie that you can fold and just eat on the run in fact when i was there when i first moved to new york and i was pitching my jingle tape every day uh i would i would go in i was staying at a friend's house out on long island i would take the train in and then i would go to every ad agency and every jingle house at that time they actually used to be jingle houses i go to sid wallace and i go to chiani music and go to all these other places and i would pitch my jingle tape and every lunch was a slice of pizza and a small fountain coke. Now at that time, a small fountain coke was a little cup like that. It was really small. Oh. I mean, really, really <laughs> small. It was legit small. And that entire deal was like a buck and a half. So I could survive on no income, basically, <laughs> every day on a piece of pizza and that every single day. And I mean, I got addicted to that. It's just, you know, it's insanely yeah. good. And then you come out here and you you have that. It's a different kind of meal. Like French French call it the uh, the uh, Chicago quiche. <laughs> they call it because it's basically a cheese pie. I love it. It's just it's yeah, it so. really is. No, I mean, I guess as long as there's pizza, I'll be there. You know, that's my <laughs> there's there's room for all kinds of pizza in my in my stomach and in my heart. I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, that's it's one of my 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 loves of life. It's, it's a good pizza night, which we try to do once a week, <laughs> whether whether we like it or not. <laughs> No, uh, gosh, what else? Do I have any other questions? Let's see. I'm, a, I at the end, I'm looking at my list. I'm at the end of my list. Yeah. So, yeah. so do you think you know me any better than you did when we started? <laughs> I think so. I think so. <laughs> I, I, I have a feeling, you know, the thing about where we are in New York, I mean, in Chicago, <laughs> you and me, uh, it's, we're in a pretty good size office and you, you guys have your, your advisor's office and I'm, and I'm up in this office, this other crazy place. That there are days that we won't even see each other. I mean, I, we'll say hi, and we're all busy, and then, oh, hey, have a great day, have a great weekend, and that's it. 
So this yeah. has been really great to catch up, and I, it's, it's yeah. great. It's great to do this, and I'm. I do know you better now. I actually think <laughs> now I know why you're so melodic because you were vocalist first. So yeah, <laughs> and I can tell everybody now. <laughs>